Hazio Ishiguro is perhaps best known for his novel, Remains of the Day. His new book, When We Were Orphans, is his first in five years. It is the story of a celebrated English detective who, during the height of the Sino-Japanese War, returns to his birthplace in Shanghai. He is determined to solve the mystery of his parents' disappearance that left him orphaned when he was nine years old. This novel is on the short list for the Booker Prize, Britain's top literary award, and I'm pleased to have Mr. Shiguro here to talk about it. Welcome. Great to Thank have you. you. Good to see you again. Uh, tell me why you wrote this and why this particular story. Uh, it's a story about wanting to fix things that have been broken in childhood. Yeah. And it's a kind of theme, in one way or the other, that I've been playing around with for a while in my past work. Here it's told through a, a kind of a detective story. But, I mean, it's not a full-blown, you know, detective story as such, but uh, it pastiches and borrows from yeah. detective fiction. But essentially, it, it's, it's about ch wanting to go back to some moment in childhood when things went wrong and fix it. Yeah. Now, why is that such an, a, a, a persistent theme with you? Well, to some extent, I think, you know, I, I, I don't want to necessarily suggest there's anything special about my own autobiography, although... Yes, I did. It is I did. For well, you yes, <laughs> yes. I mean, it's true that I, I moved from Japan to England yeah. at an early age. Right. Maybe that's got something to do with it. The fact that I can readily identify my early childhood in a geographical space that I call Japan. I mean, a lot of people might not be able to do that quite so distinctly. But I, but to some extent, I'm trying to describe a universal experience. We must all of us, even if we've grown up. The, in the effort same to place. fix something. Yeah, and and the fact that we've lost. We've lost a, a, a nicer world that we once knew when we were children. You know, I, I imagine most of us may journey out of some nicer place. Adults yeah. tend to keep small children in a bubble and shield them from the less pleasant things in life. But yeah. most of us, we had to make that journey out into the more disappointing world at some stage. And to a greater or less, the lesser extent, you know, I think this is a universal story. Many of us have something we would we regret having lost or something that perhaps broke way yeah. back then that we there's a small irrational part of us that thinks well it's not too late you can replay a bit of the past and this time it'll have a better conclusion and, and that, that's kind of what this story is about. it in any way a homage to the english detective it's not so much an homage as as uh, the detective the traditional English cozy detective story of the 1920s and 30s, the Agatha Christie, Dorothy right. S., that kind of detective story, is a taking off point. The main character seems to have fallen out of that kind of detective world. Um, in other words, he believes that you can combat evil by finding some master criminal who is the source of it. Um, that's a view that you know, held to some extent in those genre detective things that ca uh, that that view of evil has probably fractured forever to, because of the experiences of the 20th century that we know that you know bad things happen not just because of clever criminals but because of chaos you know war nationalisms racism so on wrong place wrong time yeah yeah, yeah i mean we know we know where the really big scale bad things come from and i i thought it would be kind of interesting to have a, a man who's who's who tries to hold on to that traditional detective view of how to fight evil, you know, mm. unmask the murderer, and, and let's throw him into the 20th century as it moves from one world war to the next and see how he copes. You threw out the first 110 pages of your draft? No, it wasn't the first 110 pages. I, um, I used to, but I, I did throw out 110 pages from the middle. I used to have a kind of a, a little miniature detective story within the larger yeah. story. It didn't work. Not for me, partly because I think I, I'm not a, a genre detective writer, and it's, it's much harder than people think. You have to be really good at yeah. that to write yeah. it. But also because I think it's very difficult to get two completely different kinds of characters on the same, stra same stage. I mean, it's hard to ask a reader at one and the same time to, to relate to certain characters as suspects in a kind of a, 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 a mystery. Yeah. Uh, I, and in that same book, to relate to characters uh, uh, as though they were deeper people in a literary novel. And is that, that was the real difficulty yeah. for Do me. Do you learn something about yourself with every novel? I try to. Uh, for me, to some extent, you know, writing is that. You know, it, it, to some extent, it, there, there is a self-indulgent core to, to yeah. my kind of writing. And I sometimes think it's just pure luck whether a writer like me is valued or not. It, it's, it's pure coincidence. if 
my deeper personal preoccupations happen to chime in with people at large. Yeah. Uh, that line between just self-indulgence and you know, being a, a spokesperson for, for some kind of universal condition, I think is a very, very fine one. Yeah. When you read reviews, uh, do you learn anything about your work? Yes, I take reviews very seriously, but I don't take any one review seriously. One of the fortunate things, if you're in my position as a writer, is that you get a broad range of reviews from right across the world. You get a ton. Yes. I mean, everybody was yes. on this book. Yes, but, w but the important thing is they come from different places, different writing communities, different circles of critics. I can't kid myself that you know a bunch of guys ganged up on me, you know, because I <laughs> right, insulted right. somebody. at Because um, reviewers like journalists are incapable of an organized conspiracy. Oh, well, there is that too. But because because if if people are saying that in Japan and you know the Midwest of America and France, you know, I, I can't believe they've all been con conferring to, to gang up on me. Yeah. So uh, so a broad consensus emerges of how my book was read. And I do pay attention to that. You know, whether I change the way I write or respond to it is another matter, but I have to know broadly how my book was received by people who read it carefully. But I don't pay attention to any one review. You know, I, I don't mm -hmm. get, you know, I mean, I think this is the you advantage can, of having a whole range. Do you remember most of the negative ones? Uh, not particularly. I, I remember this kind of overall kind of sure. contour of kind of ups and downs of a, you know, of a, uh, it's that overall shape of reviews. You know, it's that consensus that emerges. That that's the important thing. Christopher Banks. Christopher Banks. Yes. Um, well, what would you like to know about him? He's he's a, he's an odd guy. Um, he's a, he's what what's strange about him is that he. How is he orphaned? Might be one question. He thinks his parents have been kidnapped right. in Shanghai, uh, and he thinks it's something to do with the opium trade. Right. Uh, of course, he, uh, of course, that's not quite the way it works out. But the important thing about him is that he's 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 a small child when this happens, but he's just about old enough to think he might have been able to do something about it. He's he's ten years old, you know. Yeah. He's just at that awkward time, and so there's a part of him that thinks it, it, you know he should have stopped it, and that it's his responsibility to to put right the thing that went wrong. And so when he grows up, you know, that's what he tries to do. He becomes a detective tries to solve the mystery. Um, he tries to basically fix the world that, that fell apart when he was a small boy. Sometimes it's difficult to know what's real and what he's imagining. Yes, but that's because, I suppose it's because I, I've got less and less interested in, in writing about uh, an unreliable or crazy narrator going through a more or less <laughs> real world. <laughs> yes. I'm much more interested in actually, in a book, um, mapping out what the inside of someone's consciousness looks like. You know, I, I, so in this book, quite often, the world outside bends to the strange logic in his head, the emotional logic. You know, it, it's not the case that people do double takes whenever he comes out with some strange notion. The whole world around him concurs with some of his very odd views of the world. Um, and this is because, you know, I, I didn't want to write about a crazy, deluded fantasist. I wanted to pay some respect to that part of all of us. That is uh, from where, you know, kind of irrational, emotional motives come from. And I think, if we are honest, many of us actually, the big decisions in our lives are made not just from a very, uh, from, from very sensible criteria. Uh, we're uh, who we marry, what kind of jobs we yeah, do, no, uh, what kind of friends. I mean, or what? Uh, Finish your thought. Uh, yeah, I mean, all, all these things often derive from a less rational part of us. Yeah. We're trying to replace something. We're trying to redo something. We're trying to compensate for yeah. something from from somewhere I way back. Have you know? ever? I mean, I used to envy those people that could take a, a legal pad like this and and put, and put down the pros and cons of stuff and then reach some rational decision, because it's most decisions you just, somehow you were led to them, I thought, you know, which may make me more, you know, intuitive than others. But there was more intuitive than it was being able to sort of, you know, pro and con it. So, sometimes those pros and cons might be for real, but I often think we do that kind of thing as a kind of an alibi. Which, which part of the thing? The, the, oh, the, yeah, yeah, the know, pros and cons. Or are you looking to talk yourself out of it, or are you looking for some magic wand that's yes, not going to be there? I think it's a way of dignifying where we have 
landed. You know, this I do kind too. of the wind yeah, picks us that. up and dumps yeah. us somewhere, and we dignify where we've landed by saying, "I'm glad I did this. Yeah. I'm glad I'm here in life. Right. I did it for this reason." <laughs> but really, all these other things have picked you up and mm. put you down there. When somebody compares you to Kafka, you say what? I'm not so fond of the Kafka uh, comparison. I, I, some, I mean, that, that was done uh, uh, quite often because of my last book. Right. Um, whenever you veer away from straight, you know, realistic writing, um, people get a little uneasy, and they, they immediately compare you to the one or two kind of giants who, mm, who right, right. also write outside of straight realism. So they immediately names like Kafka, Beckett, right. Nabokov come up whether you are actually thematically or stylistically close to them or not. Because I just they have a limited frame of reference. Yeah, I, I, well, yes, I mean, it's not entirely unfair to do that, but I had a version of that earlier in my career when people used to compare me to Japanese writers, you know, simply because they saw a Japanese name on the jacket, mm -hmm. and I'd be compared to the two or three Japanese writers who are known in, in translation, you know, regardless of any stylistic uh, comparison point. Who is Lorna and who is Naomi? Oh, they're the two women in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I should say one is my wife, one is my daughter. So yeah. it's, it's not quite, quite as uh, um, exciting as it sounds. Well, no, no, it's pretty good. Um, th does it, Lorna is your wife and Naomi is your daughter? Or That's right, yes. They're, they're my uh, confidants and... Uh, yeah, they're, they're and first readers? Well, Naomi's only eight. So um, mm. she's a good reader of things like Harry Potter, but <laughs> she's not quite <laughs> yes. up to... But my she likes Harry Potter? Yes. She's, she's read all the Harry Potter books three times. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Completely obsessed. Uh, you know, Harry obsessed. Potter. Yes. Managed to wipe out Pokemon from, <laughs> the, from her, from Is her that consciousness. Right? And that's quite an achievement. Is that good or bad? I'm fairly neutral about this. You know, some people <laughs> are very alarmed that, that yeah. know, books are receding in the minds of young people. I, I haven't seen it. You know, this Harry Potter craze has taken over you know, all, all my daughter's friends, you know, yeah. not just her. Everybody. They, well, it's, it's evident in terms of the success. Yeah, and, and, and it's taken me over, so I'm very, uh, you know, quite hooked on those. Oh, books. you are? Yes, yes. I, I mean, that's the sort of magic of them that appeal to both adults and children, right? Yes, yes. I, I haven't read the latest big one, but um, the first three, uh, uh, I thought they were terrific. Uh, someone has described you uh, as a poet of loss. Do you like that? That has a nice ring about it. I think yeah, because that's displacement, too, social displacement, yes. loss. Yes, I mean, yes. Uh, well, George Carol Oates. George Carol Oates. I mean, you know, I'm flattered to, to be praised by somebody of her stature. She's written as many books as she has as well. <laughs> yeah. What do you want readers to walk away from? Readers to walk away from? In other words, they read this book and they walk away. What do you hope they will have gotten out of it other than, you know, a moving story, which is at the I heart of Every novel. Yes, yes, of course I want them to be moved. I mean, if they're not moved, the, the, the whole thing doesn't even start. That's right, you, know? you might as well okay. be teaching. Yes, exactly. I want them to be moved, but how do I want them to be moved? Well, you know, I'd like them to think about the role, for this book anyway, I'd like them to think about the role that I suppose our childhood plays in our adult lives right. and, and how sometimes a child's way of looking at the world sometimes remains frozen within us. Is for Freud is Freud helpful in this? I'm not a big Freud reader. You know, <laughs> I, I, I work more intuitively. I look at myself. Oh. I look at my friends. I mean, I don't know whether I agree or not with Freud. I don't know enough about Freud to know that. But, but, but you, if you were interested in the themes that you are, it would seem to me that you would clearly be interested when you think about the themes you're interested in, in, in terms of psychiatry and, and psychological insight and, and what we know about the way we are yes, beyond I observations of one's own life from the mirror. I, s yeah, I mean, you're quite right. I, I mean, this should be a territory I should be well steeped in. Sure. But as a novelist, I feel a certain instinctive defensiveness about immersing myself in whole bodies of work in that way. You know, it, I think there, there is something about being a novelist. It's very important to maintain your, the fragility of your own world. And I, I is whether it, it's- Is your own world fragile? I think so. I think any imaginary world that you're trying to create as a no no novelist is very fragile. Uh, it's not, I'm not you know, just writing up as a travel writer or a journalist or historian yeah. some world that I know really exists or existed out there. I'm, I'm conjuring up a world of my own, so it, it is a very fragile thing. And I instinctively fear uh, research, whether it's hard data that I, I get by going to locations. You fear it. Yeah, I fear it, and I, uh, you know, because I, it might somehow contaminate the purity of your in 
intuitive insight? Well, purity makes it sound too um, too grand. It's because <laughs> I'm trying to build. I like grand. I'm trying to just. I'm just being modest about it. You yeah, know, no. whether it's pure or not, I'm trying to build my Are world, okay. right? And it's, yeah. and sometimes going out, just to, you know, going to the to the real places can sometimes stop you building that world convincingly. And that's true with the ideas too. I, I don't want to expose myself too much to any theory or any doctrine. Um, you know, I, I, I feel a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Yeah, yeah. I want to. I, I have my own little territory as a novelist, and I, 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 de I defend it a little from other disciplines, uh, 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 you know, other chunks of research, other scholarly yeah. thought. There's some. I mean, I have considerable admiration for choosing, in a sense the area that, that uh, wanting to stay within the area that fi you find most compelling and, 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 and that speaks to you the most and resonates within you the most and, and, and continuing to dig deep into that place. Well, I think you know, if you're a certain kind of novelist, that's what you're trying to do. You're, uh, in the end, I mean, we talked about reviews and yeah. acclaim, but in the end, there is also a, a very lonely set of terms about success and failure. In the end, you do assess success and failure in very lonely terms that often has nothing to do with reviews or whatever. You know that you're after something, and you kind of know to what extent you've succeeded in doing it, succeeded in finding these things. And sometimes that doesn't have very much to do with you know, whether a book gets praised or gets great reviews. And, and so there is this kind of almost parallel career you run as a, as a writer, a lonelier one. Uh, you, yes, you, you dig around in this particular area, you know, you want to find something, and you just hope that, <laughs> from the point of view of yeah, keeping an audience, making a living, that this continues to interest other people. But in the end, it's, it's yes, you have to, you judge success and failure in very lonely terms at the end. When we were orphans. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>